Welcome to Radio OPAC. Each month on Radio OPAC, we bring you compelling conversations between artists working in all kinds of spaces inside and outside prisons. Radio OPAC is a project of Ohio Prison Arts Connection. If you'd like to learn more about what we're working on, please visit ohioprisonartsconnection.org. So I am so excited to be here <laughs> with you, Sophia and Laura and Janessa and Sarah today. Uh, I would love for us to just start by hearing a little bit from each of you about your work and specifically how movement is central to the work that you do, making art, teaching and collaborating with others. Could we start Sophia and Laura with you? My name is Sophia Phillips. I work for Keshet Dance and Center for the Arts in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And my role there is directing our M3 program. M3 stands for movement plus mentorship equals metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a dance-based curriculum that we teach within the, two of the three state-run juvenile lockdown facilities. So they're, they're long-term post-adjudication juvenile facilities. Um, we go in five days a week and teach dance and, and collaborate and create with our students. So we do a combination of, of teaching dance techniques and integrating into those techniques um, conflict resolution skills and academic skills to help support the other education that our students are getting. And then we also do a lot of creative work and, and use the, the wealth of um, creativity and artistic ability and experience of our students to create work together. Um, I'm also a faculty member with the, the M3 program in addition to being the youth leaders program managers. So we have the option that once our students are released, they can join Keshet staff as a youth leader. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's really special. Another thing that I would add to the beautiful description that Sophia already gave about the M3 program is that we focus on healing centered engagement. So mm -hmm. we're not, we address past trauma, but we're not focusing on it. We're really focusing on helping these students um, identify what their goals are for the future, what their desires are, what their dreams are, and how they can attain those dreams. Absolutely. And for me personally, I think the body is so intelligent mm -hmm. and identifying where we feel emotions in our body and how those emotions manifest. Um, for instance, perhaps it's manifesting as tension in your shoulders or a tightness in your chest, or um, if it's a joyful feeling, um, how does that manifest in the body? Is it um, spinning around in a circle or just, you know, feeling a lightness in your body? And so identifying those kinds of things and listening to that body intelligence um, is really moving for me personally. And I think also something that's very powerful to offer to our students. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. I am honored to be amongst such amazing women um, doing this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So yeah, uh, my name is Janessa Johnsrud and I live in Northern California by way of Saskatchewan, Canada. And I work at Pelican Bay State Prison as part of the Transformative Arts Program in the California Arts Council and sponsored by um, the William James Association. So I'm a faculty member at a school called Del Arte International School of Physical Theater where we look at the work and examine and research the work of the actor creator. So taking that inside to be in circle with the men in Pelican Bay, and by in circle, I mean, I'm just facilitating the space for presence. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the body and presence in space is just intrinsic and in and of itself one thing. So we look at creating original physical characters. We look at different popular forms, um, of physical theater and uh, the principles of awareness, availability and responsiveness. And I personally go pretty deep into looking to the natural world, to the physical forces mm -hmm. around us um, to uh, uh, connect um, our bodies and space and our relationship to each other in, in, in that through the forces of nature. So expansion, contraction, undulation, push and pull. Those are the, the like main tenants and you can get so deep and juicy with those things, how those live in us, but how those govern, you know, the cosmos and the world around us. So um, we play a lot 
and we improvise a lot and we breathe together a lot. So many good things have already been so said, been said um, that I hope to echo. Um, I am Sarah Danke. I direct a project called Dances for Solidarity, um, which is sort of based in New York because that's where I live, but we collaborate with people who are incarcerated throughout the United States um, and some returning citizens throughout the United States, but mostly in New York. Um, the root of the project is this co-creation process that happens through letter writing um, with people who are primarily in solitary confinement um, or some, however else that is defined in your respective prison. Um, a, a form of extreme and long-term segregation is what we're referring to. Um, the most consistent way to reach people who are in long-term segregation is through letters um, because access to phone and video visits can vary from person to person. And so we've developed a method of, um, of creating movement scores through trading letters. Um, and those movement scores are then able to live in the world in other ways. Um, we go through a rehearsal process of taking this text on, on the page and deciding what, how do we embody this text? Um, how do we make this um, come alive into space and um, have a, what I always hope to be like a very um, non-hierarchical <laughs> process um, where we all have a voice in the, in the decision-making of how are we going to embody this work how are we going to put it together in space? How are we going to present this to a public audience? And the act of presenting that to a public audience in performance is its own form of advocacy, um, you know, danced by people who have the first person experience of being incarcerated, dancing work that originated from behind bars. Um, there's a lot of subtext there and there's a lot that is um, often implied because um, the work often, you know, it, it talks about prison because that's where it came from, but it's not necessarily about uh, the trauma of the incarcerated experience, right? And that's sort of the, the real um, aim there is this dance as a form of freedom um, and that extending from that entire through line, um, the, an incarcerated collaborator taking that moment in their mind where they imagine a movement um, and or they are they are they are creating uh, they are creating dance inside of their body and that taking them to another place that is not in their segregated cell, um, even if it is just for that moment, even if they're just imagining what that movement would be and they're not even actually um, they don't have the space to execute it inside of their cell. Really, also with a goal of providing a sort of a, a uh, a new shape <laughs> where um, I identity shift in society can start to occur um, so that a returning citizen, for example, is not um, uh, walking through the world the entire their entire life thinking I'm a formerly incarcerated person or I'm a I'm a whatever other word um, <laughs> that it, that might be more derogatory um, that society puts on you and like every box you have to check depending on where you are if you're you know applying for a job or a benefit um, that you can begin to see yourself as an artist and as a performer and as a choreographer and a creator and that same identity shift being able to occur. Um, with when people are still behind bars as well. Um, so dance as a form of freedom in that way too, a freedom to shape your own identity. Mm. Wow, so just this little journey uh, from New Mexico to Northern California to New York and really all around the United States. I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that movement is a thread through all of your work, but I also noticed some other threads. We have this idea of respecting and elevating the intelligence, the agency, and the artistry of the individual people that you're working with and recognizing that those things are already there. They don't need to be brought into the room. And so I'd actually love to hear a little bit about that process of being in the room. Um, I'd love to hear from each of you in, um, from your own perspective, what is it like to introduce movement as an 
as an expressive tool, as an art making practice, as a communication medium? What, how does that, how does that work on a practical level in the work that you do? Um, I can speak to that a little bit. I, I will echo um, what Janessa was saying about play is so important in this environment. And also what Sarah was saying about freedom. Um, these facilities are such a structured, strict environment, and there really is a different energetic, energetic feeling when you're inside these facilities. It's all concrete. There's not a lot of nature um, that's accessible or windows, and um, it can feel very stifling. So just being able to use playful exercises mm -hmm. and movement to offer our students a sense of control over what their bodies are doing and their decision-making process over what their bodies are doing, I think is really powerful, not only in the moment of being with them in class, but also in the practice of making decisions for oneself and having control um, in how you move through life. That is the blessing and the joy of it for me in being in person with these students and getting to collaborate with them one-on-one -on -one in these exercises and in these processes is that we're really working with them as, as artists. And so, as Sarah was saying, there's, there's not a sense of hierarchy in there of teacher-student necessarily. It's more, we're looking at you as an artist and a collaborator. Yeah. And in that sort of place where everybody gets the identity of being an artist and a collaborator and everyone is given opportunities to make decisions about how they move. What kinds of things do you create, Laura and Precisely. Sophia? What, what, what have you seen be created in that kind of space? Sure, um, we make all sorts of things. So we have attempted to make basketball dances. Um, neither Laura and I are very skilled at that, it turns out. We, we tried, we started. Um, we've made pieces of visual art, collaborative pieces of visual art, big pieces of, on big pieces of paper. Um, we've made collaborative poems. The students have written poems. We've written poems we've sh and shared them and spliced them together and used that as inspiration for movement or, or left that as its, as its own creation. Um, we have some students working on real-time music videos right now. We've had students making dances about goals that they have, where they see themselves, what they envision for themselves, um, dances about where they've been and, and their past, um, and just silly, fun, dancey dances <laughs> when we need a, a light day or a, you know, to experience like, you know, like you were talking about earlier, Sarah and Laura, the, the joy and freedom and movement. Just sort of reminded me uh, of like the, I feel like the, the challenge with movement and especially if you use like the word dance <laughs> is that um, often that can feel so intimidating um, to a person who maybe has an experienced dance or has very specific ideas of what it should be. And so coming into a space with, with people you've never met and using the word dance <laughs> can, can su suddenly like send everybody behind a wall that I think um, requires some tools to neutralize um, because it, I've also had the experience where very quickly, once we start working through a process and, and everyone realizes, oh, this is not a person telling me what to do and there's a right and a wrong, um, then that changes the perspective altogether. But if, if you're like, I'm thinking of a group of juveniles that I worked with in New Orleans, um, it was a probation release program and um, they were told go in this room and dance like you're gonna go dance with this person and you know that's all they were told to and um it was a very um they had obviously had no agency in that and so they came in very like just even their body language was so closed off and they're slumped over in their chairs and getting them out of their chairs to just make a circle was such a challenge but I clocked it at about five minutes in <laughs> that suddenly there was a change, you know, like their shoulders were open all of a sudden, they were asking questions, they were starting to breathe. Like 
um, and dance really has that power, um, whether you want to call it dance or not. <laughs> um, so it's like, it's this beautiful thing that I, I definitely take for granted sometimes because it's been a part of my world my entire life. Uh, that idea of heart hierarchy too, um, especially in our rehearsal rooms, um, I feel like the, the, the horizontal collaboration happens um, a bit more easily actually with our incarcerated collaborators because we're just, we're both writing letters, right? We're trading back and forth. But once we bring that into the rehearsal room, um, I think especially with folks that have returned home and they've been incarcerated for a long time, they're um, conditioned to assume that there is an authority, hmm. um, whether they, that's something that they want or not. And so uh, it, having to be very conscious about the language that we use and the way that we do try to create like that, that parallel or that circular structure in everything that we do. Um, is really important and definitely still a process. Okay, so um, breath, this movement, expansion, contraction, always with us, like every moment in time, it begins, it expands, and it transitions into something else, which is another breath. Also, um, the heartbeat, uh, an emotion, um, lots of things, a tree, how it becomes expansive in the summertime with, with foliage and leaves and then, you know, that wilts off anyway. So that, that motion is a birthright in our body that we experience um, throughout our lives until we take our last breath. Respiration, espiritus, the, the Greek word for the spirit, um, simply scientists have discovered that the, the perfect like breath rate is 5.5 inhale, 5.5 exhale, and 5.5 breaths per, per minute. Um, that this balances the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous systems in a, so that our, our rest and digest and our fight and flight. So we can come into a state of balance through these two opposing things. Hmm. Uh, so um, I'm just going to lead us through something super simple. Put your hands where they're comfortable and open and available. Release your neck and your shoulders and your jaw. And feel your breath. And we're going to do six because it's a little bit easier. So you can round up 5.5. They said it's OK. The scientists did. And uh, always through the nose. Nose breathing, if you want to get deeper into research, is much more healthy and uh, hygienic. And uh, the way that we're designed, mouth breathing is actually the root cause of a lot of uh, bad things in the body. So just being available to your breath. And I'm just going to count for you. And we can do six rounds of six. That's it. So exhaling everything out and inhaling for one, two, three, four, five, six, and exhale. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhaling one, allow the air just to come in. Five, six, and exhale. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhale one, two, three, four, five, six, and exhale. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhale one, two, three, four, five, six. Exhale. Two, three, four, five, six. Inhale one, two, three, four, five, six, exhale, two, three, four, five, six, inhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, and exhale, two, three, four, five, six. Of course, we could go on. And this is the basis to build a calm mind, still like the water. So 
moving forward with something like this, if you were to continue, um, just thinking about how you bring the, the, the racing mind back to the breath, that the, there's a home in being still with the breath. Thank you. Thank you. That was so wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do that yeah. 10 times a day. <laughs> That's great. So, okay, so we've had Janessa join on a second device just to make sure that everything is working all right. I'm so glad. I would love to hear from you as well. We've, we've uh, been talking about like, what's it actually like to kind of create the space where we can begin to use movement with a group of people as an expressive tool, as a communicative tool. And I just wanna kind of lift up something really fascinating that all three of you so far have spoken to, which is that so much is possible, but it's not automatic, right? Like that it, that you have to, there is, there is a kind of work to be done and, and care to be taken, intentionality in creating the kind of, as you described it, a circle, the shape of the space has to feel circular. There has to be that sense that we are all operating on the same level, that we have permission, agency, and really, you know, authority to, to, to move in the way that we want to move, to create something with the expressive tool of our body. Help yeah, it's a really you. vulnerable thing to put your body out there, especially in the carceral environment. The physical feeling that I get, and I'm not saying that I could possibly understand the the, the how it feels for the participants, but the feeling that I get going into a space that's so guarded with walls, mm. the color, the, 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 the sounds, the way things move inside in this really kind of rigid way, it does take time yeah. to, to open up that space and agency is, is so um, important. I actually was reading <laughs> this camping manual last night and they had this, this guy was writing about advice on hiking. And he said, if you think about it, walking is just a series of falling over and over and catching yourself. And I was thinking about that in, in terms of movement. I'm like, what a beautiful way to look at walking, moving forward, that in order to get somewhere, you just have to fall and fall and fall and fall and catch yourself and catch yourself and catch yourself. If you're scared of falling, you never go anywhere. So I'm saying that because we open up our spaces by celebrating failure. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, the fall, like really encouraging people to catch themselves. So when we play physical games, there's a physical consequence. And there's this kind of like manufactured failure within that. But rather than feeling terrible in that moment that you put your body out there and there's a consequence physically, but then you celebrate the moment where you catch yourself after you fall or the group catches you after you fall. Hmm. We also tend the space by, by creating like a, like a physical force field around us. Hmm. And that comes through rituals that um, are created individually in each ensemble and then passed down through kind of like a, a mentorship that naturally starts happening. So people keep coming back to class. They keep returning to the circle. They keep, evolving a ritual so for example the very first please imagine that we have this little invisible stretchy ring mm. and we grab it in the middle and we pull it around ourselves and we breathe into and create that space together and at the end of class we re like we take it down and we push it and we make it really small and someone hides it somewhere in the room well um yeah wow. um yeah it's just it's so beautiful to hear to hear you both Sarah and Janessa talk about about your work and the way that you approach it and and wonderful to hear like you were saying earlier Jesse the threads we do something similar in our classes where we with each group we develop an opening ritual and a closing ritual for each well we start by we have the same ritual in each which is checking in with each other so we start the class by checking in in a circle we do most things in a circle also and then develop a closing ritual for the end of class too and I think that that you know, what you both touched on the, the feeling of the space and what Lara was talking about, the feeling of being inside and inside not only the space of 
you know, the facility that the facilities that we're going into, but also we're often entering the space of our students. We're going into the units that they're living in. And so in, in addition to the barriers of the physical space, the barriers of having dance class and the, and the fear that can come up around that or the resistance that can come up around that, having strangers come in, it's also their physical space. And so I think like, like you've all said that, that trust building process, the taking time and, um, and letting the space be responsive and representative to the people who are in the room and knowing that that will change group to group and it'll change day to day and likely minute to minute, depending on what's going on in everyone's lives. And, and I think, you know, coming back to the theme of movement that beyond physical movement and moving our bodies, there's movement with just the what's happening, yeah. you know, and, and being willing and ready to, to move with what's happening with everyone in the room. And then love the rubber band idea, the stretchy band. And what we you were just describing to, is about elasticity as well. <laughs> you were just, you were just getting at this idea of elasticity in thinking about being as with you as sort of a teacher or facilitator being movable movable being responsive to the temperature of the room to the to the people who are in the room how how that that kind of movement as well your capacity to pivot or shift or adjust based on everything that's happening being brought into the room by your your people Amazing. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add to that real quick that sometimes that involves, especially for us, sometimes being responsive on the daily basis involves allowing the decision to not move. So our students have rough days sometimes and sometimes they need to come in and say, I need to be a witness today. I need to take some time and sit in the corner today. I need to find stillness today. And um, giving them, them the autonomy to make decisions and again, have that control over their bodies to not participate is also a huge part of it. Work that I'm gonna introduce you to a little bit later um, from our collaborator, Dushan, um, who I know, like his work has been, <laughs> we've like really pushed his work out there, um, who Dushan is incarcerated in Texas. Um, he's been with the project since the beginning. So for about six years and um, there was something about the language of movement that um, really spoke to him in a way that I never could have expected. Um, and he has really created such a poetry through the choreography that he creates. And um, that has been incredibly, it is incredibly surprising to me each time because uh, not that I don't think anyone would have the capacity, but just that uh, the, it's the breadth of it for him. Like he, he is able to so clearly and poetically communicate movement through language um, in a way that is so fundamental to making this project actually be able to communicate outside of <laughs> prison walls and um, as a result has become an, an advocate and an artist um, in ways that he never identified himself prior um, to his involvement in the project. Um, was another really amazing dancer um, who was part of the project at the beginning named Rachel. She was working on a on a piece and she just asked him a little choreography idea. She was like, I'm I'm choreographing this phrase on stairs and I'm thinking about doing, you know, this this progression up the stairs. But what do you think of that? And like what would you do? And that opened this door wide open for for him. Yeah, I've I've got a a, a story about one particular individual who's remained with the program even throughout COVID and has grown so tremendously and has shown me a lot. Um, and the story is we, we, we started, this, the first time I tried this particular project, which I've been able to repeat because I just think it's a pretty successful model. Um, everyone in the class basically we were working on walking and crossing the space just as ourselves in their zero what we call their zero or their neutral and uh, they pick three things to describe themselves in physical space once they land on those three things they they pick the three opposite and start to develop a walk based on the three opposite descriptions 
from the walk, they start to develop emotional gestures, then a voice, then a point of view, then a whole person. And this happens over the course of week, weeks. And there was one student in particular who was pretty resistant. He's a class clown and uh, a barrel of laughs for everyone, but would, you know, uh, just w wasn't taking it seriously. And one day we had a, a, a reckoning together and he, it, 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 it dawned on him that he was the, the caretaker of this creation, of this person that he was making, the opposite of him. So rather than mocking this person, um, I'll tell you the character's name was Clive and he was a, a Texan Republican whose daughter wanted to marry uh, a Mexican man and he was, uh, he was opposed. And so this is an opposite of him. Of him. Um, anyways, he went off and became like obsessed with Clive. He would come back to class every week and be like, Clive, Clive, this is what I discovered about Clive. Do you want to hear what I wrote about Clive? Clive does this and Clive does this. And he's like this. And then, you know, he started getting really, and like he would transform into this person when we came into the classroom. And there was this relationship that developed between him, which I, you know, as a theater artist, like I've, I've had the fortune to experience with characters that I've created that you start to tend to them, even if you don't, you don't share their their point of view you empathize with your opposite you empathize with a different point of view and so it, like this this clive person is now kind of legendary in the in the circle in my circle anyway but in, in in the circle there and it was just a really beautiful literal transformation by experiencing physical transformation in in the approach to the work and um seeing the world through a different set of eyes that you make yourself So we're going to do we're going to do a little collapsed shortened exercise that we do on a much larger scale on the inside um, and it's called I am and it initially starts with them writing poetry about their past their present state of being and where they see themselves going in the future. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to identify a word, maybe one that relates to last year. And then identify a word for where you would like the future to go. Mm -hmm. And that can be on an individual scale, it can be on a larger scale. And then uh, once you have those words, go ahead and maybe put your hand on your chest, just so I know that you're ready. You take your time. Awesome. And now I'm gonna give you a few moments to, sorry, <laughs> I'm like, you're good. You know this exercise. So I'm going to ask you to create a gesture or movement for each of those words. And actually, let's, for the sake of time, let's just create a gesture for our future move. So think of your word for the future and then either create a gesture or a short movement that embodies the feeling of that desire, that dream, that goal, that hope. And identify with your word where you're feeling in your body and how it's expressing itself and then try to embody that in your gesture. Um, so I'll go first and then we'll just add them together and create a short little movement phrase that we've created together. So my word for the future is grow and I'm just gonna have us create a little tree. Yes, so it'll just come out of the ground, beautiful. Does anyone have a word and you don't have to share your word you can just share your movement with us but does anyone have one that fits well as a transition from here uh, I see. So are Beautiful. We, are let's we, do sarah's next we'll is see. that yours sarah it was janessa's no. i was just copying <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's like strong love it Fantastic. And we'll put those two together. So, yeah. grow and strong. Does anyone have one that fits from here? I think mine could fit from here. Uh, everyone's cool. frozen for me. So, oh, is that Sophia? Are we back? It's Sarah. We are literally making a dance across the world. Um, <laughs> and, like California, and... Ohio, New Mexico, and Australia <laughs> right now. <laughs> so was it was it uh, Sarah who was next after? 
Um, uh, yeah. Are we all able to see each other though? I know Laura was saying we were frozen. <laughs> oh man. Um, back, but... Yeah, I know we were here. My word is flow and it just flows like a rocking sweeping. <laughs> So we have Laura. Welcome back. We kept dancing and moving while you, uh, while you were making your way back in. Um, Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you. This is a real time example of what happens all the time in this past year. So, show me what you have, please. Oh, good. So. Beautiful. And then I can do my next. It's Ooh, love that. Loving the camera angles here too. <laughs> Mine is this. Great. Shall we try it from the top? All right, here we go. I like the sound effects also. And beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. We have a fantastic story um, from a student. We had a very unique opportunity. Normally our classes are within the high school, daily high school programming for these students. Um, but we did have the opportunity to create a postgraduate class. So these were students that were choosing to take dance as an elective because they had already graduated. Um, and it turned out that we started with four students and then one by one, they were being released. And so we ended up with one student on the inside who we were able to collaborate with on multiple levels. And we co-created some choreography at the beginning of 2019 for a show called Movement for Mercy. And we were given permission to take this choreography that was created on the inside, outside, and set it on our youth leaders and our company members on the outside. So we were already including this student into the larger Keshet community. We, end up, we ended up performing this piece live in front of an audience in February, 2019, right before things shut down. Um, got it on video, we're able to share that with this student on the inside. And more recently, he has been released and is now joining us at Keshet as a youth leader. And wow. so we have our youth advocates that performed his movement. So excited to meet this person that we also um, incorporated some of his poetry into the show. And so they already feel like they know him. And um, just to have everyone there, especially these, these youth advocates being so excited to welcome him in because he's already a part of the community. Um, it's just so incredibly moving and inspirational. And um, I'm really looking forward to getting back to in person to see what these incredible youth can do together. I, I, I just, I love these stories, the sort of ways that someone's uh, attachment to movement as a language can shape the entire future of a program or a project initiative dances for solidarity. I love this story about a person who modeled empathy for, by building a person that they didn't think that they could empathize with from the ground up and this idea of being welcomed into a community before you even arrive because you crafted a piece of movement for other people to perform. Kind of amazing. So thank you. Those, those stories are extraordinary. Um, I'm interested, I guess, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, have you all ever considered what it would be like to bring COs into the space for movement? And have you had any experience doing that? Um, mm -hmm. Or working with people who work at prisons doing similar 
Yeah, um, we, so we, and I'm not sure how it works, um, how, you know, what the difference is between staff presence while working in an adult facility versus in a juvenile facility. Um, but we have staff present all the time in our classes. They're always accompanying our students, um, which I would you know, assume is, is similar in the environment that you're working in. But we have um, some, sometimes maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, we, so, so there is staff always present in the room with us. Mm -hmm. um, and we have had some staff participate in our classes. And it's been extremely powerful, um, I think especially for this, for the young people in the class. And I think that touches back to some things that Sarah was saying earlier about, about dance being, dance carrying a lot as a, as a word and as an art form and there being a lot of vulnerability and participating in that. And then also um, to, you know, what has been talked about a lot in terms of the authority structure within a facility and, um, and the nature of the relationship between staff and, and the folks who are incarcerated. And so we, for instance, had one, had one group of students who, um, it was just, it was really challenging to focus. It was really challenging to get everybody on the same task. Even with two teachers in the room, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty consistent challenge. And we had a staff who just started taking class and we happened to be in a ballet unit and he's this, he must be like six, three, you know, big guy. And he started taking ballet with us. And so as soon as he started doing that, the, the guys in the unit jumped in. Um, I think seeing him show that vulnerability gave space for them. I think you know, especially it being ballet and a group of male students, the, the kind of relationship between ballet and, and, you know, ideas of masculinity, having him show that was really powerful. So that was, that was a time that staff participated and it was really beneficial. Another thing that's happened is that because we're integrated into the education part of the, or the education team within the facility, we have a lot of interaction with the other um, educators and, obviously with the other line staff. And so as part of the high school, there are talent shows and there's graduation. And so we have been asked by staff, education staff and line staff to teach dances to, mm -hmm. to their staff so that they can show the kids at these events. Um, and that has been, has also been really powerful. And I, again, I think Again, there was initially a lot of resistance among staff members, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them just not showing up initially, a lot of them like, no, I don't dance, I'm just going to watch. Um, and then as they started watching, you know, their peers and, and getting to know us, not just as other educators, but as, you know, in the form that we're there to do as dancers, those walls started coming down. Um, and more staff started joining in and it was super fun. It really, you know, let us connect to staff in a way that we definitely hadn't before. And I think in that, you know, in that particular scenario, it also gave them a lot of respect for their student, for the young people, for our students um, in the challenge of dance and that learning choreography is, is difficult and that it's vulnerable to dance. And I, so I think it, it allowed them to see the challenge and also the strength of, of what our students were doing in class rather than it being just dance class. Because our project is very much a collection of movement scores um, that are in text. Um, I just wanted to share a short piece of movement-based text um, that uh, was created by Dushan, who I was mentioning earlier. Um, I think what I will do is read you his intention behind the movement. Um, and then I'm going to turn my camera off so that you can just hear my voice and just and you can let the, um, his words that describe the movement lead you however they lead you. <laughs> um, so the name of this step is proper construction. And 
he says, this step illustrates our recognition of the necessity of building from the ground or the foundation up. No matter what it is that we are building, whether it be a house, a business, or a relationship, we will be committed to working step-by-step step and building slowly, carefully, wisely, and faithfully. We will not rush or skip any steps along the way. We are all builders and creators, whether we realize it or not. And when we begin to look at life as the spiritual project that it is, we will begin to see the great design more clearly. We will see the true value of our resources and opportunities, and we will realize our purpose. And so it begins, um, I should say, you can do this from your seat and adapt, or if you would like to stand, um, you can do it on your feet. All right, he begins, step your right foot to your right until your feet are a little more than shoulder width apart and your body is, is flat um, ag against the wall, he says, but you can imagine. Bend down and let your fingers hang as close to the ground as possible. Raise yourself up and join both of your hands together. And as you rise, touch your hands to your left shin. As you rise a little more, touch your right knee. Rise some more and then touch your left hip. Then touch your right hip. Rise until you are standing straight up and then touch your stomach, touch your chest, and then touch your forehead. Thank you. Thank you. So I just, I just want to um, thank you all so much for uh, this opportunity to talk about movement, to be moved, and to move together. Um, I um, am so grateful uh, to learn about your work, but also the, the, the threads that bind us together in the, the practices that we all have in lots of different places. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, sharing this with others and um, with uh, men and women incarcerated all around the state of Ohio. Um, we'll be able to see this as well. So um, that's very exciting with the general public and with our incarcerated uh, folks in Ohio. So thank you so much all the gratitude in the world. Cause the road to unity is not that far away. Everybody is the same. From the mind of God we came. We have got the power to be one.